there be peace or war? The fateful question posed by Warren Austin, head of the United States delegation to the UN, set the mood of the world at the century's halfway mark. The seating of nationalist China's delegate on the Security Council precipitated a clash between the free nations and the Soviet bloc, which only ended with the abrupt departure of Jacob Malik, head of the Red Delegation, a blunder they were to regret when the invasion of South Korea by North Korean Reds came up for consideration by the Council. In the absence of Soviet obstruction, the Security Council voted overwhelmingly in favor of armed intervention to protect the Korean Republic. It was the first police action sanctioned against an aggressor by the Parliament of Nations. In 1950, men throughout the world learned to look on the brutal face of communism. Berlin, powder keg of Europe, saw a mass demonstration of indoctrinated young Germans on May Day. France was also beset by communist-inspired strife. Red Union members adopted violent methods to prevent the unloading of Marshall Plan aid. And across the world in Japan, America's stronghold in the Pacific, the busy commies were at it again. Students went on a rampage in Tokyo with something less than successful results when opposed by Japanese police aided by occupation military police. But far more sinister to Americans was home front communism. Union Square in New York was the backdrop for these scenes of red violence. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives should World War III be forced upon America. Underlining the menace from within was Valentin Gubitschev, who received secret documents from Judith Koplan, government employee. This Soviet functionary in the United Nations was deported following his conviction. <laughs> But there was worse to come. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. Caught off guard, they were all but overwhelmed until the United Nations took its historic vote to intervene. While the Korean Republicans fought a desperate delaying action, a United Nations police force with General Douglas MacArthur as commander-in-chief was formed. During the early days of UN action, General MacArthur fought a grim defensive battle. His troops outnumbered three and four to one. Stubbornly, forces under his command clung to a shrinking beachhead in Southeast Korea. And for months, the Allies fought to keep from being driven into the sea. This, a savage war of attrition, in which no quarter was given by a foe equipped with the latest Russian armament. It was, in fact, a war of survival to gain time. The cost was high to Americans who bore the brunt under the UN banner. For here they faced an enemy who ruthlessly slaughtered prisoners, many with their arms bound. Scores died before red guns as they stood helpless. Yes, the cost to free men came hideously high as they bought time on the rapidly narrowing perimeter of their defense. In the first months of conflict, casualties mounted with terrifying speed. But 12 nations had rallied to the United Nations banner. High on the list was Canada, which organized a special brigade of crack troops for duty wherever they might be sent by the United Nations. Thousands left for staging areas in the United States before embarking for the Korean front. With help of this kind, plus air contingents and ground forces from other nations, the tide seemed to have turned when a brilliant strategic move was made in the amphibious landing at Incheon, port city of Seoul. Between 35 and 40,000 men were landed behind the enemy's lines in an operation executed without a hitch. Seemingly, the war had reached a turning point as the fresh troops started an encircling move of the North Koreans. Well armed and equipped, they moved steadily forward toward the Manchurian border under an air cover that hammered incessantly at North Korean supply lines and industrial centers. History may well record that air power spelled the difference between victory and defeat in the opening phases of the struggle. Fair weather and foul, they range the skies round the clock, bombing and strafing. The end of the war seemed in sight as the Allies pushed north toward the North Korean capital of Pyongyang and further northward to the Manchurian and Siberian borders. Then it happened. The Chinese Red Armies, numbering hundreds of thousands, swarmed over the frontier against thinly held United Nations positions. Confronted by overwhelming numbers, UN armies were forced into inevitable retreat, while men wondered whether Red China would touch off World War III. Again fighting a delaying action, UN troops paid heavily in casualties. 
Facing a foe that often outnumbered them 10 to 1, the Allies gave ground slowly, marching through temperatures that sometimes reached 20 below zero. 20,000 trapped near the Chosin Reservoir slogged and fought their way 60 bitter miles to the evacuation port of Hung Nam. Through snow-clad mountains and icy passes, they held off 200,000. Would the atom bomb be the answer to the Chinese hordes? President Truman said that it was under consideration. On his word alone rested the decision to unleash this awful force. The world shuddered at the thought, for this catastrophic weapon struck fear in the minds of men all over the world. It mushroomed into the symbol of modern destruction. This man had devised. And in the year 1950, its power edged ever closer to him, leaving death in horrible form in its wake. Its harvest of misery would be limitless, sparing no one. It might well mean a world of men ever fleeing its fury, a world in which no one might again find peace and security. With troubled hearts and minds, men turned to the solace of religion and prayer. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims thronged to Rome for Holy Year. As ominous events crowded the mid-century, five short years after a devastating war, Men of all faiths prayed for peace. And while man hoped for salvation, he could also work for it. Through the framework of his world parliament, the United Nations, symbol of man's hope for tomorrow.